You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Sarah Hendren, author of the new book, What Can a Body Do? How We Meet the Built World. Sarah chats with us about how we think and talk about disability, reframing independent living, and designing a world for everyone. Stay with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Thank you infinitely for supporting the show. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the numerous projects of the overhead wire, our 14 year old daily newsletter, where you can sign up for a two week free trial by going to the overhead and our audiobook production of Raymond Owen's 1909 classic town planning in practice. Pick it up and listen to it as a podcast by going to the overhead or Raymond And finally, we've got a live YouTube show coming up on election night, November 3rd, where we'll be joined by at least 15 guests from 3 to 10 Pacific, 6 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern Time to cover transportation ballot measures and topics. To watch, just go to youtube.com slash the overhead wire and join whenever you need a break from the other madness. That's youtube.com slash the overhead wire. Before we get to this week's show, I want to let folks know that they can get this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, and of course, Apple Podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And subscribing means you get both this show, Talking Headways, and Mondays at the Overhead Wire, where this music I'm talking about comes from, on the same feed. Two fun podcasts, one great channel. Subscribe today. Well, Sarah Hendren, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, so before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So broadly, I'd say that I'm a humanist in technology. I'm trained in fine arts and design and cultural history. And I'm also a professor at an engineering college, Olin College of Engineering, which is outside Boston. It's a tiny little kind of laboratory school for engineering education. So no one is more surprised than me to find that I landed here, but I'm entering my seventh year. So I think a lot about how the humanities shape design and engineering. And for the last half dozen years, I've been focused on the research area of my book, which is disability and design. So all the places that bodies meet the built world, so everything from products to environments in, you know, atypical and non-normative ways and what happens at that juncture and what do we know about it, how we build the worlds that we want. And what got you into that? How does someone get into that realm of study? Yeah, well, mostly the sort of formative moment was my own child, the first of of my three children being born, my son Graham, who's 14 now, he has Down syndrome. And I have a number of sort of atypicalities in my extended family, a lot of folks on the autism spectrum and so on. But really the birth of Graham was this kind of breaking open of my imagination because I watched him, you know, the early years in physical therapy and occupational therapy and the, the, you know, just the riot of gadgetry that was, you know, present in those settings. And I started to understand because my training again in fine arts and visual culture and in history, the way that the stuff he was using was also mediating ideas about him in the world. And so not just the functional kinds of tools and supports, but also the kind of symbolic work that all material culture does. And it it tells us something about each other. So I started looking at that stuff. And I had also dropped out of a PhD program, gone back to the studio, which was kind of my first training. And so I was looking at that time, the time of his birth, for a way to bring together my interest in making things and my interest also in seeing things as indexes of ideas, you know, like seeing where stuff comes from and locating them in a kind of legacy. So Long story short is that after I had children, I sort of went back then to to graduate school in design and found a way to bring all those interests together and then landed in an engineering college to try to teach this field of what's typically known as rehabilitation engineering or prosthetics and assistive technology. That's its kind of normative way you talk about the research in tech, but to teach it from a kind of humanistic and sort of critical and deeply engaged, fed by disability studies, like that kind of lens on building technologies. And so that's the short version of how I sort of landed in the classroom laboratory studio, that kind of combination. And then in the course of all that work, met so many people building their own things, people who would call themselves disabled people. 
and discovered so many interesting stories about how stuff gets built and ended up writing this book about it. What's been the response to the book so far? It's called What Can a Body Do? Yeah, it's called What Can a Body Do? How We Meet the Built World. And it's been incredibly gratifying to hear from people who feel like the stuff in their lives has its proper place. In other words, if you look at kind of tech journalism around prosthetics, there tends to be this very breathless innovation future story being told, and a lot of it emphasizes the technology. So look at this high-end sort of innovation that comes in, swoops in, and saves someone, right, with a quote-unquote broken body. And really, it's much more interesting than that. I mean, the ways that disabled people have been tinkering with, adapting their worlds at all scales for a long time in ways that are hidden because they've gone to the mass market or are beneath the concern of kind of the high-tech laboratories. They're more in people's living rooms, that kind of thing. Or they happen at scales of cities and streets that have kind of gone to sleep in our cultural imagination. And so once I discovered that, started reading deeply in disability studies, I thought, boy, you know, I wanted people to know that. So I've heard from a lot of folks who are disabled would say, thank you for getting it right, you know, for sort of locating that creativity. And I've heard from people too who want to go into design and who see themselves, can see themselves in it. And there are lots of people who go into design at different points, right? So people who figure out, oh, it's occupational therapy or it's special education or it's maybe design and fabrication in these various kinds of ways. And so that's been really, I mean, to be honest, it's a quiet book and a loud year. So <laughs> there's no getting around the strangeness of that, right? You know, to bring a book out that has to be handled like a biohazard, you know, at a retail store. So it has not been usual in any way, but it has also, of course, entered the world at a time when a lot of us are thinking about the barriers between bodies and worlds and our interdependent nature, the nature of our interdependence with one another, right, in our very bodies. And the mask as the, you know, biological and also political prosthesis, you know, it's been such a strange time to be thinking through these things anew. You had the discussion about the media kind of covering the sensational aspects of what can happen. And I feel like we have this in the transportation and urban planning space, too. We have people who will, you know, be walking to work every day and then the community gets together and purchase them a car. And it's, you know, something that people go through and they get a lot of support for that. But then people aren't looking, they're doing that one individualistic thing, but they aren't looking at kind of the overall policy related to that. And it made me think of that when I was reading your book. Yeah. And and I was wondering about the air on chairs as well. I mean, I was reminded of this one reading about the air on chairs and who should we be creating design for? Yeah. And I'm wondering like how that resonates with you in terms of like these singular interventions versus like an overall policy approach. Yeah, completely. I'm glad you brought it up. I tried in the book to, it's structured at scales that expand out from the body. So the chapters are limb, chair, room, street, and then finally clock, which is a conceptual idea. And I try to cover all those scales precisely to kind of get at this multiplicity that's related to what you're talking about. So I do cover prosthetic limbs that people wear on their bodies, some that are bespoke and some that are mass manufactured, same for products, same for architecture, interiors, and then also urban planning. And all of that is to show that good ideas can come from lots of places. And you are right that perhaps, especially in an American context, in an age of viral media, there are a lot of interests in the kind of heartwarming stories of one, what looks like a kind of tech savior moment. So for example, the notorious example in disability tends to be the wheelchair that climbs stairs, right? There tends to be a lot of excitement online about equipping a wheelchair to kind of overcome that built environment barrier. And I'm not here to say whether those things should be built or not, but what you will find from the disability community is a much greater interest in a world with curb cuts and ramps and elevators built into it. Why? Because at infrastructural scale, you get an acknowledgement of lots of kind of bodies trying to make their way through with smooth passage through the built environment. And you get at infrastructural scale that guarantee of a more elasticized and friendly city, right? So curb cuts, folks who would listen to your podcast will be familiar with curb cuts as this really quite improbable and astonishing infrastructural scale that literally bent the built environment right up to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And how interesting it is that an anti-discrimination law had in it architectural code. It understood that in the very atomic and material structure of the world could be bias, right? And so to then roll out curb cuts at city scale 
is an acknowledgement of cities that make room for lots of kinds of passage through the built environment. So we can be sanguine about better products, absolutely, right? And we can also then ask for a world that with a legal mandate at civic and infrastructural scale, provide something for more of us more of the time. And people point to curb cuts, of course, as one of the, quote, universal design kind of wins of the world, meaning, you know, wheelchair users were the ones who lobbied for curb cuts, but lots of people benefit. And if anyone listening has pushed a stroller through cities or walked a bike or dragged behind them wheeled luggage, same thing with elevators and so on. These things were thought of as kind of very narrow niche uses that turn out actually to be friendly to a lot of bodies. That's not the only reason to do them. If you want a democratic culture, you build for everyone to get around. Nonetheless, we see that bodies are inherently prone to vulnerability and fragility and to changing needs of dependence over time. So there was an insight there that's useful for everyone. And technologies break. You, you know, you want, a, you want a good, strong, supple, non-brittle set of systems for getting around. Yeah. I love how you're in the Bay Area. If you go to the Ashby Bart Station, you come up at the Ed Roberts campus, right? Yes, yeah. And you can see that in action there at the Bart Station. And you talk a lot about Ed Roberts in the book. That's right. And lots of people don't know, I feel like that history has been lost, maybe not to your audience, but certainly to a lot of folks in the mainstream, that his work as a civil rights leader, and there's a key kind of design set of elements in that story. And if people are in the Bay Area, it is worth a trip to the Ed Roberts campus on the Berkeley campus because of the glorious, beautiful red ramp that is built in that building. It's open to the public and it's a tribute in his name. So Roberts was a high school student in California who was a polio survivor in the 1950s and patched into his high school classroom and to community college via telephone. So in terms of distance learning, he was way out in front, you know, and sort of making that work for himself and used a wheelchair his whole life, along with a lot of complex medical equipment as a result of his condition, and was encouraged after some time in community college to apply to Berkeley and got in. But Berkeley was not prepared to make room for him in their dormitories and other kinds of structures, but they couldn't rescind his admission. So he went to the hospital on campus and talked to a doctor, you know, the hospital there built on campus, the sort of clinical setting on campus and talked to Dr. Henry Brown, who had worked with a number of polio survivors. And Brown said, well, why don't you live here in the hospital as your dormitory, which sounds like a kind of patchwork fix. And yet that was a kind of design decision to see that hospital reframed as a dormitory room that then launched a whole possibility for other students to come and live in that hospital wing while there were students at campus in the ensuing years. And so there were you know, a dozen or something students living there in the 1960s, along with Roberts, and that proximity of living together, having changed that literal architecture into a symbolic architecture of being on college campus, being the architects of their lives, but involving medical help with their independence. Like that was the seed of something really big to turn that room around launched an idea about who they were going to be. Remember, these were folks who had grown up living with their parents and being treated as clinical subjects only, right, as quite passive in their own lives. And here they were arriving on campus to choose their majors and to, you know, become adults in the way that college students always do. But they were also managing the hiring and firing of personal attendance and thinking about how they were going to orchestrate their day and also manage their time and so on. So the hospital became a dormitory and independence for these folks was also reframed as something that could include help in it. So the key figures in that moment said, we're not talking about independence as self-sufficiency. We're talking about it as self-determination. So we can be the agents of our lives and still have help in it. And that sort of setting of Berkeley launched the first Center for Independent Living, which is a storefront for folks off of campuses to outfit their homes with adaptive architecture and so on, but also to hire and manage personal care attendants and all that. And that Center for Independent Living became the Independent Living Movement, and those centers are now replicated all over the United States. So it was a paradigmatic shift in thinking about what it means to greet the built environment with assistance in it. It's really quite astonishing, that idea. And again, Centers for Independent Living are these storefronts that people have probably driven by and as with every good idea in the world, it goes to sleep as a kind of novelty. It becomes kind of part of the fabric of our existence. And my sense is that books do their best work when they waken us to those histories. 
And it leads also to the discussion you have about Steve, the man with ALS and his sailing house. Yeah. Which he had designed. It's an amazing discussion about how you can live with assistance, but also design for your own kind of independence as well. That's right. So Steve Sailing comes at the end of this chapter that we meet Ed Robertson called Room. So it's this chapter about thinking about the room as the site of making a life worth living and rethinking independence and thinking about richly about dwelling, like all the stuff that we do in our interiors. But Steve Sailing is now 14 years into an ALS diagnosis. And when he got his diagnosis 14 years ago, he was trained as a landscape architect. So he was trained to think in terms of design. And like anyone started watching, of course, pharmacology and research in science for a cure would want a cure, but understood also that he might design a life worth living as his mobility diminished and his mobility is quite diminished now. He uses just small head movements and his eyes as his only mobility. But what he orchestrated for himself is a residence that he could live in with that rich idea of independence in mind and the legacy of Roberts and others. So what that looks like in terms of technology is that he's got a cursor that's mounted on the nose bridge of his eyeglasses that talks to a a wheelchair mounted tablet that will open and close all the doors, open and summon all the elevators in the residence. This is on a floor of of a nursing home in Boston. It will also turn off and on the media and music. It will, you know, run the HVAC in his room. It will, you know, do all kinds of automated, what would we would think now of as smart home technologies, but it's a closed loop system that he orchestrated before those technologies came to the market. And by the way, are utterly private and free from the, you know, the deal that we've made uh, in smart home technologies to sell our data and so on. That's another topic of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so Steve has said repeatedly, that in the absence of medicine, technology is the cure, he would say, for ALS. And I try to sketch in the book both what that means to hold both things to be true, right? That he would rejoice tomorrow in being cured of ALS, but that he also built a life worth living, you know, with technology, but also with care. And there again, the legacy of Roberts and others is really vivid when we say, for any of us, right, when and if our bodies change, what's the life that we'd want to build, right? And would it be a life free of help in it? Maybe not. Maybe a life worth living already includes help, you know, the the kind that we don't acknowledge if we're non-disabled people at the moment, but also that help might be creatively reconsidered, you know? And so Steve lives in this beautiful home that looks like a home, that is painted in warm organic colors and looks like a living room and nothing like the cold clinical setting of a hospital. It is impressively designed with technology and it also is a site of human care. And he's very busy and fundraising and doing all kinds of things all the time. And I think it challenges a lot of folks idea of their own independence. Honestly, I think ALS is a hard diagnosis and it also is a portal to understanding some really deep wisdom that disabled people have known for a long time. In that realm, there's the technology discussion, right? And when I was reading your book, I thought about on my back porch, there's a lot of plants and we net them because there's squirrels and crows and things. And the other day I came up and there was a pebble from the backyard sitting on the back porch. And the only way that could get up there was by a crow and the crow using a tool. And it just made me think of that when I was reading your book, because often we think about technology as something in the future, but rather it's something that aids us in what we're trying to do as as humans even. And I I just found that fascinating. Yeah, it's so true. And we get to that discussion because of an interesting thing in my field, right, which is just the specializing of technologies for disability as being labeled assistive technologies, right? And I use that term, it's a shorthand in the field, but it's a really telling redundancy, right? As though all technologies, what are they doing if not assisting? They are assisting fundamentally. And so I try to take that kind of, you know, new eyes, estranged look at what it means to be a body at all. And I think there's a reason why we locate tool use as a key moment in developing human civilizations. It's not the only one. Sociality is equally as important for sure. But tool use nonetheless is how we just make an abstract plan in our minds and get something done. It's how we would have hunted and gathered in the past and built fire in those things. And it's how we right, outsource our brain power in lots of ways to smartphones now to free up our mind to do other kinds of human tasks. And so what, what do we gain by looking at this anew? You know, for me, it's this kind of wonder that maybe the extended body with stuff, and I'm talking about pencil, chopsticks, you know, but also hearing aids and eyeglasses, 
maybe the extended body is the natural state of the body. Maybe that is what it means, right? To never to be not extended. And if we see it that way, then we see all of ourselves as getting assistance from our assistive tools. And that means we live on the planet where people need help. <laughs> and if everybody needs help, right, then there's a kind of continuum that doesn't make us all the same by any means, right? We're, we're different across multiple axes. But nonetheless, if we see that connection, then we stop maybe thinking in such patronizing terms about people with disabilities or in sort of pitying terms about folks who are living with less mobility or mathematical intelligence than others. And we maybe we think of ourselves as slightly more human, you know, as a result. And that kind of goes to the normalization discussion, how we decided to create norms. And it's interesting to think about why we do things like compare ourselves to X percent of other people and <laughs> those types yeah, of things. That's right. Yeah, the fortification of normalcy with desirability, right? So the normal, I do the most kind of cursory history. This is a long and complicated history, but the way that normal became sort of the sciences of statistics and averages became not just a way to measure one another, but also a way to grade and rank and hierarchize one another. So folks may know that normalcy in the population sense is just a, an inheritance of the social sciences that was, you know, early 19th century phenomenon. So it hasn't been with us forever. And of course, the social sciences are really useful to us for understanding each other at population scale. We want to understand groups and how they behave. But the legacy, the sort of pernicious kind of shaping of the meaning of normal over the course of the 19th century and at its peak in the eugenics moment of the early 20th century is the conflation of normalcy with what is good and even the enhancement and the pursuit of normalcy. And so, right, meaning just the idea that humans can be graded in their physical qualities, but also their moral and intellectual qualities. And when you wed that with a kind of nationalist fervor, late 19th century, early 20th century of improving nations as a whole, then you get this kind of eugenics wish to weed out undesirables, right? And to promote the so-called desirable norm. And, you know, folks maybe even think that Right, we we can probably agree that the ugliest eugenics violence is behind us, and yet the long legacy of that—it's a nonlinear one—but the long legacy of that is still with us in the sense that if you go to the pediatrician's office with your child, they are graded right on percentiles. The way they are spoken about overwhelmingly, and and in high stakes testing and so on, is about where they fall percentile wise compared to their peers. Again, it's useful on some scales, but it, it has a way of creeping into our evaluative and descriptive language about each other in general, how we measure up compared to others, and whether we are ahead of the curve or not, and whether our child can compete, and so on. And so it frames life as a race and a kind of curve of gradations and achievements that I don't think any of us want to be held under sway, you know, under that sway. I think, I think we want our lives actually to have dignity on other grounds, you know, full stop. So normalcy is this kind of in the water perniciousness. I mean, frankly, we have seen some eugenic logic in the rationing of ventilators and all that speculative discussion that happened this year around COVID-19. It was pretty clear, actually, that folks were making calculuses in their heads about whose lives are worth living or not and who had a quality of life and so on. And so it is at the door, I think, that same kind of grading of one another and I can say to you quite strongly that I think each of us wants to establish a kind of dignity of human life. And of course, that does beg for first principles and other kinds of grounds, you know, like how do we know where, what is a human life worth? It gets pretty deep and philosophical pretty quickly, right? Yeah. You talk about language framing, and I think this book is an amazing look at how the world's view of disability is framed, especially the social versus the medical models of, of disability. You know, it's hard to get people to rethink some of these ingrained inertia. And I think this is kind of something you're intimating, but, you know, there's this ingrained inertia around the topic. I'm wondering how people can get away from that initial inertia that they feel because it's been ingrained in people in ways of how to think about this topic. About disability as a medical phenomenon. About disability, purely. yeah. Yeah, it is funny because, so people will see throughout my book, it is a it is a whole repository of decades of wisdom and writing of disabled people articulating this a difference between a medical and a social model and yet we still do need to be having this conversation you're right so I tried to, in the book, try to translate it to very layperson's terms in order to try to make that connection, just to add a voice to what has been a really strong intellectual tradition in disability studies. 
So just to orient people, very broadly, this is, I'm just going to make a sort of crude binary here, but, but in the scholarship about disability, we can understand a medical model of disability as one that many people, I think, now take for granted. The idea that a disability is something that is purely biological. It happens to you. Your legs work or don't in whatever kinds of ways. Maybe you have what you talk about as an impairment or what would have been called a handicap some decades ago. And you think of disability as something that maybe you're proud of, maybe you struggle with. But in a medical, purely medical model, it is something that is purely biological and it lives on your body and therefore is your responsibility. In a social model of disability, you just widen the aperture, the lens a little bit to include not just the body, but the interactions with stuff around it. So in a social model of disability, yes, of course, people have biological facts about their bodies, but the, the actual disabling may not be actually on the physical side of the body itself. In other words, the best example is to say, my friends who use wheelchairs would say they are not disabled by the fact that their legs don't ambulate. They are disabled by a world full of stairs. So what that means is actually that the disabling interaction is what's happening between the body and stuff, between me and this desk and me and this chair and me and holding this bottle of water or not. And so what you get then is just a vastly richer set of questions, which for anybody in transportation and planning should be really imaginative and exciting to think about, which is to say, are we trying in any given use case to help bodies come to the world a little more easily? Or are there moments where, and history shows there are, where the world might come actually to bodies a little bit more, right? So think about the kneeling bus and think about, again, curb cuts and think about retrofitted elevators and think about the use of handrails and think about braille on outside of elevators and so on. Ways to manipulate the physicality of the world so that it actually does the elasticizing work and the adaptation. And so a, a social model of disability just invites you to see what Rosemary Garland Thompson calls the misfit that is the condition of disability. And she says, it is being a round peg in a square hole. Well, where's the, so quote, problem lie between a round peg and a square hole? It runs both ways, right? It runs this way and back. And that's what's happening in disability, which again, just gives us bigger and better questions as we proceed through the world. Where is the locus of the challenge and where then might the interventions be for designers and engineers? And that to me is just an endlessly fascinating set of questions. Again, in the field, of course, this is like way more complicated and you know, it's a whole realm of scholarship, but just that simple reversal I find still holds a lot of power for designers and engineers. We're having this a little bit of a reckoning now with public participation because of some of the slow street stuff that's been happening. And especially here in Oakland, there's been a lot of discussions about you, quote unquote, planners didn't ask us whether we wanted this or not. And I'm wondering how that kind of frame comes to the disability community, too. I mean, in terms of rethinking public participation and along those lines as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been interesting to watch the shared streets or slow streets initiatives. And I know in my own city in Cambridge, we have, I mean, it's right outside my house. I watched this happen. There were a lot of community webinars and things that for weeks and weeks before any of the physicality was implemented and the speed limits and such to try to get that feedback. So that's just good human centered design stuff. And I don't know what your process was there. And we all know of situations where there were gestures at community engagement that were actually, you know, maybe not widespread enough or not, you know, like sort of dependent on a certain kind of connectivity that not everyone has. But there are more specific kinds of things with the disability community around a feature of shared streets that includes, for instance, storefronts and restaurants expanding onto the sidewalk. So I know in Boston, the mayor's office was way out ahead of this and they offered to send a kind of temporary ramp kit to any restaurant that wanted it so that right if they were gonna extend into the parking spaces on the street, they would have a ramp down from the sidewalk. But even then, I know that you've gotten some some widths of wheelchair passage problems cutting through sidewalks and so on. But I do think, I mean, it is interesting to think about shared or slow streets in general, sort of leaving aside the thresholds with businesses situation, which I do think is an important one. I mean, I think about my own son, Graham, and the way he weighs risk and kind of depth perception and so on to cross a busy street that's been really useful for us, for him to think about him going across the busy street to the park or whatever, like just knowing that the average speed is slowing down, that slowness is actually making for a, a safer overall environment. So it all just depends. I mean, it seems to me 
shared and slow streets should be the epitome of the prototype, right? You start small, you pilot small programs, you gather a lot of data, you get a lot of feedback. You know, we have sandwich boards that are acting as physical barriers to slow cars down, but they're not permanent bollards yet right there. So there's this very particular way that you roll things out so that you can favor reversibility, right? You can take notes on things that you hadn't planned for, that kind of thing. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion about technology that was developed because of war and also the idea of prosthetics coming from this time in, in history when people were losing limbs but still surviving. Even recently, I saw you know Alex Smith of the Washington football team almost lost his leg, broke it. He had sepsis and almost died, and they were able to fix it because of the technology they developed in Afghanistan. Wow. And I'm wondering kind of how we square that kind of development of technology that can help people versus where it came from. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the deep ironies of engineering in general, I think, right, is almost like impossible to disentangle from the war machine. And certainly that's true in what's called rehabilitation engineering, which is, again, is, it's, it's a post-World War II phenomenon that rehab engineering came to be a national priority with all kinds of NSF funds toward it. And, you know, just the feeling that is of obligation toward folks who've made big sacrifices for their country in the form of technology and technology that doesn't, the promise of it and the persuasive story around it is meant to sort of restore function, but also to restore the sense of self and identity. And so in the book, I reference a historian named David Serlin, who talks about how prosthetics were really nothing less than meant to be a replaceable you, he says, you know, like that, in other words, there's a powerful story of persuasion coming back from the war, missing a leg or missing an arm. And the, there was a powerful incentive, not just for those men who were coming back, but for everyone else seeing those men and the story of that victory to have been restored in the form of prosthetics that made a lot of people feel like there had been some, you know, recompense. So that's a story that we can carry and be grateful for. In other words, the deep irony that the war machine that kills and maims with technology, enhanced by technology, also then drives the kind of curative healing technology for coming back and surviving. And that, right, prosthetic limbs are offered to people who perhaps in prior centuries would not have come back from the field, right? They would have bled out there, but because they're surviving those combat situations and returning home, they get prosthetic parts. And, you know, it's true in terms of landmines too. I mean, there's just, we travel in the limb chapter to see the Jaipur Foot Organization, one of those outposts in Ahmedabad in India, where I visited. And those folks there in India are building and designing a low-tech lower limb prosthesis that they've perfected over the years and evolved with really sturdy materials suitable for lots of kinds of environments, manufacturable for about $50 a piece and distributed for free. And that's a quite robust and remarkable program when you think about innovation or impact. A lot of times, rich countries of the world, certainly like the US, people tend to think like only the best that money can buy is the sort of best that's owed to people in a condition of injury. But there are all kinds of ways to think about impact. But again, the Jai for Foot organization is partly providing those limbs to folks who have been injured in landmines. I mean, there's just no way to disentangle that's why anthropologists call the stuff in our lives material culture, right? Because it is an index of sites of flows that are political and historical and technological all bound up together. So do each of us also benefit from war machine technologies? I'm sure we do, right? Every day. And this is one of those conundrums of being a human in the world. You mentioned you've been to a lot of places. I'm wondering if, I know it's hard to pick favorites, but is there a place that you really enjoyed or you know made you think more than some of the others? Yeah, I mean, I will say that I think all the time about the Dementia Village that folks will probably on your podcast will have heard about because it's gotten quite a lot of press, but in VASP in the Netherlands, it's called De Hokuik. So people know it as the Dementia Village, meaning that it's a locked facility, a nursing home that is also the simulacrum of a street. And so it has in it brick streets on which you can bike and also a grocery store and a barbershop and a gym and a theater and all kinds of things that are real in their operations. But they're also, again, it's a nursing home and a high security one at that. 
But the thing that really stood out to me that stays with me is the restaurant that's on that campus because it actually has a porous structure. So it is partly internally facing for the residents who live there and partly externally facing. So you can be a resident of the town and go have lunch there. And there were people there the day that I visited just having a business lunch. And there were folks, residents who were wandering in who were clearly wandering and were clearly a little bit confused. But there was like a mother also from the town with her young children and these folks having a business lunch. And there was this very humane exchange among all these people. And in fact, the mother was sort of modeling that humane exchange for her children. And that mother was going to exit out the door, right? And so were the business lunch folks. And those residents were going to go back in. But the idea of a porousness of that architecture is so compelling to me because here are these folks in this condition from which they will not recover probably. So their lives are mostly locked away. Security has to be paramount. And yet here was a way architecturally to keep a, some kind of continuity of their life in a public way. And I just thought the, the attention to that kind of detail and the, again, the humaneness of it was so ingenious and not hard to replicate, you know? And so the word is always attentive to me. And the idea that with some thoughtfulness you could plan, you know, and it doesn't always have to be this really expensive measure. It's a measure of policy and norm setting and what we'd call service design, right, in the fields of design and engineering. So I think all the time about the dimension of the village. I think the most interesting thing about that piece to me was first that the people that designed it decided that the place that they were had created initially was not one where they would put their own parents. That's right. right. They decided they were like, I don't want my parents to be in this place, this sterile right. environment. And the second is kind of a funny, and I don't think it was targeted at you, but the quote, the Americans are always amazed. Yes. Was yes. <laughs> another one. Because I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, I guess maybe when you go to the Netherlands, you're generally amazed. And, and especially if you're a planner and you go there. My parents lived in, in Rotterdam for a year. Mm. And I was amazed when I went to visit back in, I think it was 2000 or so. But that quote stuck out to me. I don't know if it, it stuck out to you as well. It's so true. Well, so yeah, just to orient your readers again, so De Hoogwijk, this famous dementia village that has visitors every day, 25 years ago, was the site of a very run-of-the-mill memory care facility in that probably people are, are thinking of right now, like a locked building with a long bay of rooms and so on. And so they just rebuilt on that very site. And as you say, the key difference, and it's like, it's the simplest and most profound thing in the world, is to look at the status quo and go like, hmm, is this acceptable? If it comes to, to me, you know, to me and my own family, is this the acceptable, you know, just it's regrettable but can't be helped and the people who decide right that the status quo is not acceptable and they're going to build something else i mean i never get over how magical that is because it should be quite ordinary you know but it takes commitment and all kinds of red tape and so on but and they were able to rebuild this place where you'd want to be trust me were you to have dementia but right so you're referring to this scene where i go into one of the dwellings and people do live in these dwellings of six or seven folks a piece and they have a working kitchen in them and they have caregivers there who help the residents who are able to cook meals they go to the grocery store and plan and cook meals together and all of that is part of patching together a continuous daily life that has you know by memory and association and spatial relationships it ties them right to their past in a way that's reassuring and it means they don't have to depend on medication as much to quell their anxiety and so on anyway so in the kitchen like you open the drawers and there you know there are sharp knives there for preparing meals and I forget, I must have said something like, oh, you know, like you, so they can handle the knives and whatever. And the guide said to me, yes, they can. To us, it's worth the risk. And she said, the Americans are always amazed, meaning, of course, right, that, I'm, that in a litigious culture, safety is paramount in a good way. But that also means that risk tolerance is at rock bottom and sometimes at the expense of any quality of life, right? And I do think that a lot of times the fear principle when applied to very old folks and to very young children, designs out of their lives some of the acceptable resilience risk, right? I mean, this is a whole realm of scholarship in and of itself, right? I realize how controversial it can be. But boy, she made the pointed, you know, kind of remark that, and you do have to ask yourself, what's the life that you would want to live at that moment? You know, to be hermetically sealed from any possible harm, and for what? Where are your pleasures then, right? Where are your pleasures? Where's the meaning? Where is the purpose? Where is the connection? That's what we know makes our lives worth living. So we need to ask ourselves, 
when thinking about our own parents and in thinking about our own aging bodies, what's the kind of risk and reward we'd want to design, you know? It's interesting to me specifically because my grandmother is 107 and just about two years ago, she finally accepted having people live with her all the time. But she's been blind since the 1990s. Basically, I don't think she could go anywhere else without being comfortable. And so it's like one of those decisions that you make. Yeah. And she, you know, she didn't want to, but after she <laughs> broke, she broke her ankle and then came back from it at 105, which is amazing, 104, amazing. 105. But, you know, it's one of those things. And those comments, you know, struck me just because of that specifically. Yeah. Living with help. Right. You also discussed time. And, you know, time for me has been annoying. I'm kind of one of those, I think, uh, phase shift type of people who is a better off at night rather than during the day. And I hate the morning. <laughs> it's just like my least favorite thing in the world. When I stopped working at my day job and I started sleeping with my own schedule, I started feeling better, like generally. Yeah. Does the clock bother you as well? <laughs> The clock does bother me, and I, I guarantee you it bothers your listeners. You know, I mean, we're habituated to it, but yeah, so the clock is the only object in the book that is a purely conceptual object, so I'm not really thinking about clocks as assistive technology, literally, although of course they are that, but more, much more as the timekeepers of our lives. And this was my way of trying to account for design for slowness and that kind of misfitting. So, so far in the book, we've talked more about you know, deafness, blindness, mobility issues, wheelchair use, and so on. But there's something that's more challenging for design, and that is when the misfit is about developmental, you know, kinds of states of, of misfitting. So I'm thinking in particular of my son, Graham, who has Down syndrome, and thinking about design for developmental disability, which I have not taken up in the lab or the studio, right? Because it's, it is a conundrum, and I wanted to see, like, what is the design here? So that chapter opens with a scene in Singapore looking at the, this incredible planning decision there of what's called the Green Man Plus program. So the green man just refers to that you know, walking figure that is on the pedestrian call box that lets you, you know, tells you to go across the street as a pedestrian. And in Singapore, the Green Man Plus program is your Metro card if you're a senior citizen or a disabled person you can get your card outfitted with a sensor that will actually buy you extra seconds in the crosswalk. So it will extend that any given crosswalk by 12 or 13 seconds, and then it will revert to its normative time schedule. And this to me is just like a genius kind of intervention. Again, probably not new to folks who are listening to you, but to me, that's a kind of design for slowness that is instructive, instructive in part as a solution, but also instructive as an insight about how slowness arrives for a lot of us in different moments of our lives. And for my son, Graham, and for folks with developmental disabilities, it's the misfit of not proceeding through, for instance, K-12 education, and therefore the economic 40-hour-a-week sort of work productive citizen gradation of being a human that is the place from which a lot of us derive our human worth. That is our capacity to quickly navigate through, to be on time and on the clock in the high percentiles of the testing and grades and so on. Again, to what? To go to college, to compete, you know, yes, to pay our bills, but also to establish that we are worthy, you know, in the eyes of the economic order, the market economy mapped onto all parts of our lives, right? So you can be sanguine about market economies. You can be a realist about needing to be a working person to pay your bills. And also you can question whether that clock should measure all the ways that you are seen in the world, how you're evaluated, the quality of your relationships, the transactional nature of all your exchanges, and so on. And it's been parenting a kid who's profoundly misfits in that way that has shown me, invited me to a much deeper and richer exploration of how the clock actually comes for all of us, right? That, and so I trace in there a little bit of just the history of you know, daylight saving time and the, the order, the sort of standardization of time, which again, we think of as quite eternal, but it's not, it's only a few centuries old. And it's really a product of industry, making industry sort of maximally convenient for all of us, like the expansion of the railroads. Yes, it, it, in a realist way, it works well for our lives right now that we agree what time it is in Boston versus in Oakland. But the clock as a kind of monolith, this kind of exacting metric for how we're going to decide who's worthy and who's not, who has a good life and who doesn't. I mean, Down syndrome is rendered, you know, it's not a disease itself. It's a genetic mutation, you know, but non-normative intelligence is spoken about as a disease, you know, and how telling that is that the slowness of Graham's particular kind 
is so undesirable and so unnormal as to be thought of as a real sickness, you know, as opposed to another way of being in the world, another way of being with dignity about it. So that was me trying to engage with the reader to show not just the misfitting that arrives for people with developmental disabilities. And by the way, there's some service design in there oriented around developmental disability, but also to look at ourselves and ask which kinds of measures of the clock are maybe inhibiting a lot of us in a lot of ways. This is my last question. Is there a question about the book that you you wish you were asked more? That's a really good question. I mean, I am so eager for people to engage with the ideas that are beneath the design, you know? So in so many ways, I'm eager for people to be excited about the design itself. And I spent so much time describing it and trying to evoke its qualities, sensory and material qualities. But really, I'm so eager to talk about ideas of adaptation, ideas about independence, ideas about assistance, and ideas about time, that it's like all the design is a signpost, you know, to something else that's going on. And I am eager for people to ask the biggest questions, which is like, how can a person be, you know, what is a, like that Wendell Berry book, what are people for, you know, like that's to me the real jugular that disability ultimately goes at, you know, that it knocks at our individualism. And that's a kind of prized first principle state that I want more people to ask themselves about. Well, the book is What Can a Body Do? How We Meet the Built World by Sarah Hendren. Where can folks find the book if they want to pick one up? Yeah, they can find it on Bookshop for sure. The Penguin Random House site has a page for the book that's got a bunch of buttons for including Bookshop, which is also, I think, the site of IndieBound. I do hope people support their local independence in a pandemic. So yeah, lots of places. Awesome. And where can folks find you if if you want to be found, that is? Yes, I do want to. Sure. I, lo- I love to connect. SarahHendron.com is my website and I have a contact form there. Happy to connect there. And my Twitter handle is Ablerism, A-B-L-E-R-I-S-M. Awesome. Well, there's so much more in the book. I hope folks go pick it up. There's a lot of stuff about deaf space and and more that we just didn't get a chance to chat about. I feel like I could chat with you about this stuff all day, but yeah. I hope folks go and read it and check it out and have some good questions for you. Thanks so much, Sarah, for joining us. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate it. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Overhead Wire on the web at theoverheadwire.com. Sign up for a free trial of The Overhead Wire Daily, our 14-year-old Daily Cities news list, by clicking the link at the top right of theoverheadwire.com. And please, please, please support the pod at patreon.com slash theoverheadwire. Many thanks to our current patrons for their ongoing support. And as always, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overclass, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. See you next time at Talking Headways.